Hi, welcome to This Is Getting Old. I'm your host, Melissa B., PhD, and today we're going to be talking about the Health and Aging Policy Fellowship Program. So I had the opportunity to do this fellowship in 2017, 2018, and I highly recommend it. It was a great way for me to gain some um, expertise and skills in the policymaking experience at a national level, but then also better understand how um, to get policy passed at a state level also. So the goal of the Health and Aging Policy Fellowship Program is to help professionals in the aging space gain the skills and experiences they need to impact policy to improve the quality of life and quality of care um, delivered to for older Americans. And so this is a program that's sponsored by the John A. Harper Foundation as well as Atlantic Philanthropies. And any citizen of the United States who does work in the aging space is eligible to apply to this program. It's um, highly competitive and basically there are a series of orientations that you can attend online. You would start by looking at the Health and Aging Policy Fellowship, um, their website, and it gives you kind of the key dates and when these orientation um, phone calls or webinars are held. And that's a great way to get a little bit more information about the program. And then I'm gonna share what my personal experience was um, with this. So for the application process, you would decide if you wanted to do the residential or the non-residential track. And if you wanted to do a non-residential track, you would propose more of a project to do, um, maybe with a particular organization or agency within the executive branch or judicial branch or a private foundational organization um, that, you're, that matches your area of expertise and that you want to gain um, some experience with. The residential fellows typically have some type of con congressional experience. So they either serve in the office of a member of the House of Representatives or a member of the Senate. And all again, all of that depends on what your um, interest and area of expertise is. So that really kind of drives making those decisions. So you will write your proposal and then if you're selected to interview from there, hopefully you make it to being selected as a, as a fellow for the upcoming year. And what the fellowship does in the beginning is you have a five week orientation in Washington DC where you go and basically stay there um, for that period of time. So the first week of the orientation is with the Health and Aging Policy Fellowship Program itself, as well as Academy Health. And then you have four weeks where you are learning about the um, current issues in Congress, the actual legislative process, the great refresher from US history when you were in high school. And also you'll get a chance to go to like the Library of Congress and you get to go to different offices and agencies within um, the US government. So we went to visit CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Also got to go to the um, State House of Maryland um, to watch their legislative process to get an idea of what, how things um, compared at the state level compared to the federal level. And really just got this broad range of experiences of how policy moves through the, um, the process and how the executive branch and legislative branches inform each other or are impacted by each other and then the role of the judicial branch as well because we did get to sit in on one Supreme Court case. So when you're choosing your project, you're looking to see what the current work of the agency that you might want to work with, what are their current priorities and how you may fit into carving out some type of project for yourself. Um, in my case, I did non-residential, but because I live close enough to DC, I was able to have a legislative experience. And so I decided that I would um, like to serve in the Senate on the Special Committee for Aging in the office of Senator Collins, um, who is the chair of that committee. So the things that I thought about in determining my placement were, what were the priorities for the Special Committee for Aging? And one of their big areas of interest is Alzheimer's disease um, and Alzheimer's care which is exactly you know, a great fit with my professional background. But they also are interested in um, elder abuse, frauds and scams, um, and uh, pricing of insulin and other drugs with Medicare Part D. And so it was just a really good fit for me and the experience that I wanted um, to get. And so basically I kind of negotiated 
special projects around all things Alzheimer's and got to do things like helping prepare for hearings, got to help write some briefs, got to do some work on um, some of the bills that they were going to be introducing, in particular the Geriatric Workforce Improvement Act. Um, it had a different name in the 115th Congress, um, but basically that's when I did my fellowship and I got to drop that bill in the hopper. And then when Congress turned over in January, they reintroduced the bill because it didn't have time um, to get approved um, during the 115th Congress. And that Geriatric Workforce Improvement Act is basically a piece of legislation. It's the only federal legislation and the only federal program that we have to help prepare more healthcare professionals in geriatrics. So it's meant to um, create programs around the United States to help prepare prepare our workforce to take care of older adults. In addition to the work that the Special Committee for Aging um, was doing, it was also great to see other nurses who were on the Hill giving testimony. And you know, I'm a little biased because I am a nurse, um, but got to see the um, director for James Madison University give testimony for the Health Committee, which is the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Um, and so that was just a really neat experience um, to have. Some of the other experiences that the Policy Fellowship will give you um, is looking at legislation on the state level. And so we took a trip to um, Maryland, to the State House, to see how the state government operated. So one of the other things, if you do a legislative experience and serve in a member of Congress or a House of Representatives office, is you do actually get to go make a visit to the state office um, and not just have the um, federal level experience to actually go back to the home district of your member. And so for me, that was Maine. And at the annual Alzheimer's hearing um, in June of 2018, um, met some folks from Jack's Labs and told them that we were going to be doing our, my state visit in two weeks. And I was sharing my um, hand feeding techniques. And so they invited me to do a presentation while I was there for my state visit um, with people from the local Alzheimer's Association, as well as people from Jack's Labs and other members of the community that were interested in Alzheimer's care. So that was a highlight for me as a nurse scientist to get to go do my policy um, visit and incorporate um, my work into that as well. So that was a lot of fun. So some of the other experiences um, while I was during my state visit is I got to tour um, two biomedical labs, um, got to go to um, the, the state capital of Maine, as well as meet some of the staff members in the Maine state office for Senator Collins. I also got to have my first uh, Maine lobster while in the state of Maine. So that was another highlight. So one of the things that also happens around the same time of the, the um, annual Alzheimer's hearing is they have a national Alzheimer's dinner um, the night before. And so for, with that, I got to meet Marcia Gay Harden. She had written a book called Memoirs of My Mother, a story of life, love, and flowers. And it was a great book. And she was gonna be testifying with the hearing the next day. And one of my favorite stories about the, um, the Alzheimer's hearing I did, or the national dinner, is that as we were leaving, I got a great picture with Senator Collins. And then also as we were kind of moving out into the lobby, I saw somebody coming by. I was like, oh my gosh, like, I think that's Billie Jean King. So I like said it a couple of times. I was like, why am I telling Senator Collins that Billie Jean King is walking by? But I think Billie Jean saw me do that. And she was like, Senator Collins. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. These ladies know each other. And she, the first thing that Billie Jean said is that she was like, I want to thank you again for supporting my nomination. And I was like, oh, I wonder what they're talking about. And so they began to talk and Billie Jean was explaining that she um, had been nominated for the Presidential Medal of Freedom, but in order to get that award, you have to be not, have a nomination from a uh, Republican and a Democrat. And so Senator Collins provided her the support from the Republican Party. And I started looking it up and I was like, that was fully like nine years ago. So just two super classy ladies, um, love them both. So I offered to take a picture and my only mistake here is I didn't get in the picture. This great shot of the two of them um, that actually then Senator Collins tweeted out. Um, so that was a really neat um, experience to have had and bringing social media in um, to the policy experience. So then helping to write some of the speeches for Senator Collins had great fun incorporating some of the social media stuff that I do. Um, and thanks to the Alzheimer's Association, the, there was a piece of legislation um, 
in progress at the time of my fellowship and it was called the Bold Alzheimer's Act, which stands for Building Our Largest Dementia Infrastructure for Alzheimer's. <laughs> so it's very confusing to have dementia and Alzheimer's in the same title, but the hashtag was hashtag Bold Alzheimer's Act. And so in one of the speeches, um, I had found that online. And so I put that in there as well as the word Twitter sphere and was pretty sure she had never used that um, term before. Um, but it was fun to kind of see that and also highlights the point that the role of social media and kind of social movements can help move legislation through the legislative process because what the Bold Act, um, what it intends to do, and it was signed into law New Year's Eve of 2018. Um, by President Trump. It's meant to help all of the public health departments um, provide education and outreach to not only family caregivers, but also healthcare professionals to detect um, Alzheimer's early and to begin to have conversations about advanced care planning and really just to provide the resources that our families and communities are going to need over the next um, couple of decades as we have more older adults and more and more people with some form of cognitive impairment. So. Um, to me, that was a lot of fun to be able to participate in writing some of those speeches and working on the legislation and seeing, you know, a bill that had been in the works actually get signed um, into law before the end of the 115th Congress. One of the other things that we got to do as part of this fellowship was to work with the Canadian um, parliamentary Canadian Parliamentary Fellows. And so this is an exchange program where we went to Canada and got to see how their government works, um, got to see, um, visit with one of their Supreme Court justices, as well as to watch um, kind of some of their legislation um, and how that process compares um, and contrasts to ours here in the United States. And then you know, from that trip, probably the most memorable thing was we were, um, in center block and we were in an elevator going up to the top um, to get a view of you know the, the area and we got almost to the top and me, me and about eight or nine of my closest friends were in this elevator and it got stuck and we were stuck up there for like an hour but we did get out we did survive um, and they're now like renovating center block and hopefully fixing the elevator when the canadian fellows came to the u.s one of the things that we did with them is we took them on a tour of the White House and the East Wing. Um, and so that was another, that was the first time I'd actually even been into the White House. So hopefully it was a highlight for them during their time here in the U.S. with us learning about um, the United States government. And one of the other highlights for me was in the spring, they, uh, there is a communications workshop that is held. And John Bielinson and Chris Gerst from Strategic Communications and Planning do a one-day Full day workshop around um, how to write blogs, how to write op-eds, and the role of social media in um, kind of getting our voice out there to educate the public um, and people about different legislative issues. And so that was also another kind of highlight of the, the program. So thank you for joining me today as I kind of shared my experience with the Health and Aging Policy Fellowship. This is an annual program and you just need to go to their site if you're interested um, in becoming a fellow. The applications are generally due every spring um, around like April or May. So go ahead and check it out. If you have any questions, um, you can give me a call and you can also look at all of the other past fellows to see if there's someone that shares an interest um, similar to yours and you can always just email that person and ask them you know kind of what they did for their fellowship most of the fellows are really excited to share um, their experience and also tell you about how it's influenced and changed um, their lives moving forward so highly recommend it look into it and thank you for joining me today